Thank you so much, and thanks, thanks for being here tonight, braving the, the weather, although I guess you've had a lot of weather for the last six months. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here to, to share some thoughts with you uh, based on this book that I wrote, Immigration Outside the Law, and it's a book that I worked on for some seven or eight years. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the things I realized is I was a year away from finishing this book for about five years. <laughs> it's sort of the way these things go, and I think a lot of it is because of the complexity of the subject. Uh, as Dan said, this is a very contentious field. Um, one of the things that I try to bring to it as, as an academic is that I have some pretty strong views on some bottom line issues with regard to immigration policy. But I also uh, lament the polarization, the political polarization, uh, that's, that's happened on this issue over the last, you name it, two years, five years, maybe the last generation. Um, not that it's ever been a site of, of universal consensus, but um, part of the reason I wrote this book was not only to explain the way I think about these issues and to suggest some ways to think about it, but also to try to get a conversation going so that at least people who disagree with each other have some sense of why they disagree. So the book, at a, at a larger level, has two purposes. One is to create a framework for understanding why people might disagree with each other. Uh, and the other purpose of it is actually to suggest some things. So it's a, there's a lot going on in the book. So maybe what I should do is, so that, that we have, I want to provoke, some, provoke you to ask some questions. And I'm really very interested in what, what uh, you push back against, uh, what you'd like to hear more about. So what I'm going to do is just to, to, to talk keep this first part of this uh, as uh, succinct as possible and to tell you a little bit about where the book is coming from, from the sense of you know, what exactly prompted me to write it and what it's about. And then I'd like to give you a sense of what the structure of the book is. In other words, how I go about trying to help explain why people disagree so much about uh, what the book calls Immigration Outside the Law. And the very title, Immigration Outside the Law, is an attempt to start from a more neutral place than illegal aliens or undocumented immigrants. Um, the term I use in the book is unauthorized migrants, which is kind of a, a social science term that may seem like odd English to talk about unauthorized migrants. Um, it's often that you talk about the undocumented or people who are illegal. But I'm really starting in that this more neutral place. And, and, um, and I'm trying to, um, to really unpack Debates. So here's here's what I should explain about the book. Uh, you know, Dan generously mentioned uh, an earlier book I wrote called Americans in Waiting, and I want to tell you a little bit about that because these two books are in many ways companion books to each other. And I guess when you look at it that way, it took me 16 years to write these two books. But uh, Americans in Waiting is really about the um, the relationship that this country's had between how we treat immigrants and how we treat citizens. Um, and we think of ourselves as a nation of immigrants, what does that really mean? And in particular, let me just show you, this is the um, this cover of the book. And so it says this family in Chinatown, 1920s, uh, waiting to cross the street. So that's really uh, thinking about, are immigrants are Americans in waiting? Do we treat them as future Americans, or do we treat them presumptively as outsiders, or are they presumptively insiders? And so the dilemma that this book tries to confront is this, that we think of ourselves as a country dedicated or built on some notion of equality, or aspiring to equality. And at the same time, we seem to take it for granted that we have a national border. And there's something about having a national border that immediately creates inequality. People are on the outside, people are on the inside. That, that's, that seems like a regime that's, that has inequality built into it, and yet we think of ourselves as a country that takes equality seriously. And so this is a very fundamental dilemma, and, and that's, in many respects, the subject matter for Americans in waiting, and in particular, the question of how do you deal with equality, how do non-citizens fit into that, if, if you create non-citizens through citizenship laws? And in particular, um, I'm trying to figure out how equality, this equality dilemma, matches up with the idea of immigrants, we have citizens. And my solution to this, which 
just giving the very short version because the long version is usually the book, is that there are ways that we can be faithful to equality if we give people access to equality, if we allow immigrants the chance to become citizens. They don't have to be equal to start with, but we have to give them access to equality. And some of the access to equality, many of the arguments for access to equality are grounded in various notions that I think if I name them are going to be very familiar to you from just reading the newspaper or, um, or just having conversations uh, with people. And that is sometimes we think of um, the way we treat immigrants, our sense of fairness the way we treat immigrants is to protect the expectations. Uh, people come here, they maybe you think that they promise not to go on welfare, or they promise not to commit crimes, or something like that. It's that kind of language. So one of the things I develop in this book is the idea of immigration as a contract. Um, that's something you often hear. But you notice that sometimes when we talk about immigrants, and we say, well, someone who's in the country illegally, they've built a life here, they've contributed, they have a stake here. Now, one could argue that they've broken the immigration contract by breaking the law, or by being here in violation of the law. But then there's a counter argument, which is that might, that might be true, but um, we, we might say that we want to offer them legal status because they've earned it in some sense, and that they've become part of the society, and that's really what this book talks about as immigration as an affiliation. And then if the third idea that the book explores is that uh, it was particularly in the 1800s, a time when I think the country, this country, treated, Ameri treated immigrants much more with the expectation that they would become US citizens. Uh, we allowed citizens, we allowed people before they became citizens to vote. We allowed them to homestead, and they could do this. They could vote and they could homestead um, pretty much from the, their arrival in this country, from their arrival in this country. And that's not no longer true. So this was the idea that uh, we're going to presume that immigrants are citizens. We're going to presume that Americans are waiting. This, the, the, this book is really about that phenomenon. And, but it develops a vocabulary for thinking about what justice is in the immigration context. How can we, how can we reconcile um, equality with the very fact of borders? And one of the ways is to develop a vocabulary, not just a word vocabulary, but a conceptual framework for understanding that immigrants have certain kinds of claims, and these are the types of things they have. And if we respect those claims, then maybe we can be a nation devoted both to equality and to the idea that at least uh, that, that, that the borders serve, serve some kind of function. Uh, the difficulty with this, by the way, and I'll come back to this, but so and this is going to be a footnote in this part of my uh, explaining this two-book project, is that uh, the idea of intending citizenship, the idea that you could come to this country and be presumptively American, that was tied to the idea of intending citizenship. In other words, that you could declare your intent to become a citizen, and then you'd be treated in this way. And this is what this book tries to recover, this is why the subtitle is The Lost Story of Immigration and Citizenship. Uh, the catch, and it's a big catch, is that citizenship access was racially restricted until 1952. So this was the way European immigrants were treated. Uh, but to be slightly cynical about it, as immigration became much more open in the 20th century, and the discriminatory rules were gradually dismantled by the uh, mid part of the 20th century, as immigration became more open, it became less valuable to become an immigrant. It became uh, less of a presumptive, you're going to be an American. Uh, so this is, that's what this book is about. But I say this because this kind of way of thinking about it is really what, what propelled me to this, this next project that, that, that I'm sharing with you tonight. Because America's Waiting is not a book that addresses undocumented, unauthorized, or illegal immigration. It doesn't really talk about the 11 million in the country without lawful status. Um, and that was one of the criticisms I got about this book, because we're at 11 million people, and of course the answer is, I have to write another book <laughs> about, about that, which took another eight years. Um, and that's what this book is about. This is about our immigration outside of the law. Um, and and um, I don't need to restart my computer. We don't want to restart the computer. Um, it says those updates are important. <laughs> no, it's, uh, that's all right. Uh, well, I'm not going to restart the computer. Okay. Um, but here's the structure of the book. 
There's a Supreme Court case called Plyler versus Doe. Some of you may have heard of it. It was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1982. In 1982, the Supreme Court of the United States, in a narrow 5 to 4 decision, held that the state of Texas could not bar kids from going to public school, K through 12 public schools. The state of Texas could not bar them on account of their immigration status. Or more specifically, it could not bar them because they were of the country that they were. And this is a bedrock decision of, of American law in the sense of that. Um, now, one can think of it as, as, as potentially precarious decision in the sense that, you know, I think it was a very narrow five, it was a very narrow five to four decision. It was a decision that one could say, well, if it rose today, you know, there might be some doubt as to how the case would come out of the American court. But the reason I'm, I'm, I start with the decision is because it's an interesting window into the way this country thinks about immigration. When, when Justice Brennan decided, he wrote for the majority, that Texas could not keep kids out of K through 12 public schools just because they were in the country illegally, he had to do three things, I think. There are three issues that, that he had to confront. And on these three issues, the, the dissent, the four justices for the dissent, um, had to come up with a very different formulation and had to take a very different approach. So I'm really using, the book starts with Plyler, and it starts with Plyler as a lens for thinking about debates, because Justice Brennan had to do three things. And, all, um, and, and one of the things, well, I'm going to go into in a second as to what he actually did, but one of the things I want to suggest is that in, in, in saying that to tie the two books together, one of the things that happens in that decision, and in my book, actually, there's a bottom line here, is are unauthorized migrants Americans in waiting? The answer I give in this book is yes. In other words, the project of the first book extends to thinking about people here without lawful status. But I need to explain why I think that to be true, and that, that journey starts with Plyler. Plyler, in, Justice, in, in Plyler, the Justice Brennan really had to do three things. This is review the simple diagram, which actually appears in, in uh, the introduction of the book. The first thing Justice Plyler had to say, and he does say this, is that, you know, people are in the country illegally, but that doesn't mean they're going to be deported. It doesn't mean they're going to be deported, and it doesn't necessarily um, mean that they were simple lawbreakers. There's a sense in that opinion that, you know, we have a labor policy de facto of labor policy that says that, 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 that tolerates people being here and you've relied on, on unauthorized labor for generations. So that complicates this question of what it means to be in the country. So one of the things he ends up doing is really coming down on this, on this question of are, are people here undocumented or are they illegal? So Justice Brennan, that's one thing that Justice Brennan does. The other thing Justice Brennan does, it says, he says that the state of Texas has no business, no legitimate business, deciding who's going to be in this country or not. So the second thing he has to do is to, is to take a very narrow view of what it is that states and all the cities do. And the third thing he has to decide, uh, and he says this, is he says, you know, these kids are going to be in this country. And it's a national tragedy if we allow a group of people to grow up in this country without an education, without, without a public education. And this is the part of the decision where Justice Brennan quotes Brown versus Board of Education and says, um, education is the key, the essential element in citizenship. So he has to do this um, in order to reach his decision. Could have gone the other way. The dissenters say, you know, um, people are in the country illegally. That really should be the only thing. The dissent also says, the state and local role is really legitimately includes making decisions about access to public benefits, including going to public education. And the dissent really is unwilling to think of these kids as having a legitimate place in American society. So what this book tries to do is, these are actually the first three chapters. Um, the first chapter is, is, is trying to confront the various views of what it means to be in the country without lawful status. The second chapter chronicles the historical role of states and localities. And the third chapter confronts the question of why we have borders 
and how, um, in my view, that unauthorized migrants have claims to be treated as Americans in waiting. And I want to say a little bit more about the, the engine that drives this, which I think is really number one, undocumented or illegal. I want to say a little bit more about that. Um, but I think before I do that, let me give you, we're going to want to talk about the structure of the book and how I sort of unpacking this. And I hope that as, as I go through this, you see that you know a lot of times you, you hear debates about immigration policy, and one side says, well, you know, people in the country unlawfully, that's just not that big a deal. It's like, you know, driving 60 miles an hour and 55 mile an hour, mile an hour speed limit. But other people are saying, essentially, what part of illegal don't you understand, right? So it's a, that, that captures that debate in chapter one. Um, state, state, of, state of Arizona has, has taken a lot of measures to try, and actually Georgia and Alabama and several other states have taken measures to, to enforce immigration law. That's you know, that was true when Texas tried to do it in the 70s, 1970s, and early 1980s. Same thing today. Um, and um, and when you talk about, uh, some people think of people who are undocumented here, and the conversation is really, well, they're just, they're just part of us. And other people really reject that notion. And so these three themes in Filer end up being the lens through what I think it's possible to kind of understand why people can see each other. So let me just say a little bit more about the structure of the book. Go back to a little bit more to what it says in chapter number one, and then see what, what questions you have about this. Um, and I could give you like you know, a summary of every chapter, but that would be here longer than you probably want to be. Um, so, one of the controversies that's come up um, recently, as I mentioned, is the state of Arizona and other states have been trying to enforce immigration. So, why do people disagree with me about that? Okay, well, that's chapter four about enforcement. I think it's really hard to decide what Arizona's role should be in enforcing immigration law. It's hard to decide what Arizona's role should be unless you have some view of what it means to be in the country unlawfully. If you believe that being in the country unlawfully is a very serious offense, and it's very clear what that offense is, then I think it, it stands to reason that you would want more people deputized to apprehend, detain, because, after all, the part of the legal knowledge is um, If, however, you think that you prefer the word undocumented and think of people as, think of um, the unlawful presence as not a serious violation, then I think that you're going to be very um, reluctant to empower every cop on the beat to make decisions about who should be deported. But, so that's chapter four, and chapter five um, recognizes that the state and local role is not just to enforce. The state and local role is also to be the place where immigrants, regardless of their lawful or unlawful status, become integrated into communities. And so, chapter five is about building communities. And those states that decided not to enforce I talk about in chapter four. Those states that have decided not to enforce, but rather to give in-state tuition to undocumented students or give driver's licenses, for example, uh, or decided uh, to recognize labor rights, for example, that's where communities are built. That vision of the state and local role <coughs> only follows if you, if you, these states, and I do think this is true in these states, that the legislatures who legislators that have decided to have in-state tuition, for example, for undocumented students, that there is a recognition that those students are Americans. So this is an attempt to show that the state and local role really has two aspects. And they implicate, they connect the three original climate themes in a certain way. And the last, almost the last part of this structure, uh, before I go back and say more about chapter one, um, is legalization of the rule of law. There's a lot of debate today about whether uh, people who are in the country unlawfully should be given legal status. There's a lot of debate about what's called legalization, or sometimes the word amnesty is thrown around, although that's become kind of a word that people try to avoid these days. Um, and the real question is, what explains why people disagree on giving people lawful status? And 
a lot of it is because those who really are for legalization start out with a certain vision of what it means to be in the country and all of it. And then combine it with the fact um, that these undocumented migrants are Americans in waiting. And then it stands to reason that not only should they be legalized, be given legal status, but it also stands to reason that doing so is consistent with the rule of law in spite of their unlawful status because it recognizes through law their place in American society. So, so this is the this is so this is another way of understanding why people disagree about I think four, five, and six. Four is about why people disagree about Arizona. Five is about why people disagree about driver's licenses and ID cards and and it's a tuition for the undocumented or unauthorized. And six is an attempt to sort of bring together chapters one and three to figure out what it's what it is that uh, people disagree about when they talk about legalization. And by legalization, I mean giving green cards eventually and a path of citizenship to people who are in the country and lawfully. But it's also about things like the DREAM Act, which would, which would, grant, which would grant lawful status to people who are, who are in the country who were brought here as children. And then chapter seven, oops, uh, this. chapter seven, let's run through this real quick. Um, chapter 7 goes a little further and says, you know, where are the answers to be found? And this is the chapter when uh, it deals with the role that, that temporary workers might play in dealing with unauthorized migration. It deals with the role that international economic development can play. It also deals with the role that educational policy in this country could play in making sure that immigrants who come in don't displace and disadvantage um, people who are um, really in, the, in, the, in the, the most precarious position economically and socially inside the United States more important here. So that's really the basic structure. Um, so I have to say that a lot of the book doesn't lend itself to sort of like, well, here's like the 25 word argument. Because much of the book, I have to say, is, is an attempt to take about 40 different subjects and show how they all relate to each other. So this book talks about the DREAM Act, it talks about temporary workers, it talks about Arizona, it talks about birthright citizenship and the idea that people born in this country are uh, citizens, it talks about Mexican labor migration, it talks about Chinese exclusion, um, it talks about international development. So much of the book is an attempt to really get a handle on all the things that are out there um, in policy and to really try to show how each of these issues is connected to something else and to show how people's disagreements um, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you really think that, um, that the DREAM Act is a good thing, then it might mean that you also believe these other things uh, about immigration policy. And you know, here's, a, here's an interesting example that I never really thought about until I got to this part of the book, is the DREAM Act uh, would legalize people who are brought to this country as children. But you know, the 14th Amendment kind of does the same thing. Uh, the 14th Amendment, um, the 14th Amendment is kind of a legalization program, in a way. Because if you didn't have the 14th Amendment, you'd have kids born in the country with their parents born <coughs> in the country unlawfully, and they would be, then, if you didn't have the 14th Amendment, those kids would be in the country illegally, and you'd need the DREAM Act, and you'd be advocating for a DREAM Act with them. So there are a lot of connections like that. Um, so let me just uh, do one other thing, just, just for another five minutes, and then I'm really interested in what, what um, questions or pushback or, or more requests for elaboration here. Um, you might have. And it's really to say a little bit about the uh, specific argument in, in the first chapter. Um, and this, this particular, I want to mention this because I think that much of the book, if I had to pick a chapter that sort of drives a, a, a lot about this, uh, I'm going to do that. That's fine. I was done with that part of the talk anyway. Um, so, the updated version. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. 
means I, th I think a lot of what drives the book um, with regard to many of the things that follow after chapter one is really the description and analysis I give in chapter one on what it means to live in the country unlawfully. And one of the ways that I, I think about this is chapter one is an attempt to explain why it is why why it is that we have 11 million people in the country who are here in violation of immigration law? Why is how did this happen? And I think a lot of your explanation for why this happened and how this happened is going to drive many reviews on many things in this area of law. And, and here's the short version of it: is that this country, um, especially in the period when as they say, the frontier was moving west, and, and, and labor was needed to, to, um, to till the soil, um, to cut down the forests, uh, to work the fields and the factories, and you know, some would say also to, to, to uh, engage in armed conflict against Native Americans. Uh, but, but a lot of what the whole history of, America, of American society in, in the last 150 years, or really maybe it's the entire history, if we can really go back to slavery as part of this, has been the quest for a labor force. Um, people who would drive this, or at least be the basis of this economic engine. And what happens in the, in the, in the uh, just starting from, if you just almost arbitrarily pick, um, pick the period after the Civil War, and you have uh, the uh, Take, a, take one example, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad was largely, uh, so it was a labor force that was 90% was Chinese immigrants. And so after the railroads were built, there were economic recessions, and you had a swing toward Asian exclusion, Chinese exclusion. Um, Chinese are excluded, who's going to do the work? It's Japanese labor. Japanese ended up being subject to exclusion laws. It came the Filipinos. Um, as Philippine independence came on, that labor source dried up. And much of this is a story of the turn toward Mexican, Latin American immigration, but particularly Mexican immigration in the period of the early 20th century. Um, and this was an interesting period because it was a period of not of a lot of uh, strict border control. In fact, the first border patrol agents were called Chinese inspectors. And the reason they were called Chinese inspectors is that the function of the border patrol originally was to keep Chinese from coming through Mexico and getting around the exclusion laws. And so you had a period, this period, roughly speaking, from the early 1900s, I'm sorry, the yeah, early 1900s on up to the 1960s, where migration from Mexico was not uh, controlled, and I mean that I mean in two senses. There was not a lot of border control, and there was no numerical cap on Mexican immigration. And uh, so people came back and forth. There were a lot of uh, ideas that were very influential in Congress. The reason we want Mexicans, they will go back, they won't stay, but they'll be a flexible, cheap labor force. And this was also reinforced by the Procera program. The Procera program is a program that basically allowed for um, temporary workers to come to this country legally, but under very, <coughs> very, very exploitative conditions. What happens in, 19, in the 1960s is that this all changes. In the 1960s, you have a series of, of what we now think of civil rights laws Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And you also have the Immigration Amendments of 1965, which did a little away with a lot of the discriminatory, racially exclusionary laws that preceded it. But the cost of imposing that formal equality and saying, we're going to stop this regime that's, that's explicitly discriminatory against Asian immigrants, the cost of that is we're going to treat all countries the same. And it means that. Um, the situation you had with Mexico is the Bracero program ended because of to really curtail labor abuses that have come to light. For the first time, you have Mexican immigration being numerically controlled. Um, and at the same time, the emission categories get reworked in such a way that there's no line to stand in for people who come to this country who don't have a college degree or close relatives. So you had this entire history of um, many sectors of American economy coming, becoming reliant on Latin American uh, labor. Uh, that was pretty much cut off, but people still kept coming, and the employee jobs were still there, and the employers still wanted to hire them. So the regime shifts from regime of uh, Chinese exclusion, for example, 
to a regime of, we're going to make a lot of people illegal, but we're going to kind of look the other way most of the time. We're not going to have enforcement systems that serious. Uh, but people will come and do the work. And every once in a while, we'll be shocked that they're here and can't come. But it's a very discretionary, um, it's a very discretionary sort of um, system. And so in a nutshell, the system that we have in this country, um, and the reason we have 11 million people in the country who are undocumented is because we have a system of very selective admissions. Let's very few people in that the economy wants to employ. Then we have very selective enforcement because you have 11 million people in the country. The Congress doesn't fund uh, in a enforcement capacity because I don't think the political will is there to keep people from these jobs. And it means that you have a, a system that really runs on selective admission, selective enforcement, and a huge amount of discretion. A huge amount of discretion. So that's when I tend to complicate this idea. It's not a simple matter. And of course people are here, <coughs> love other people in the, con in the country unlawfully. But what's really going on is not just that they're in the country unlawfully. What's really going on is how is the discretion going to be exercised to choose the unlucky undocumented migrants who get apprehended, detained, deported? Who makes those decisions? So you can see how this relates back to my concerns about Arizona's immigration enforcement. Because if it's not a, if it's not a clear matter of someone being in the country lawfully or not, it's really a matter of discretion <coughs> exercise to choose the unlucky few who are deported from time to time. I don't mean, by the way, to diminish the pressure from enforcement. It's very harsh. But numerically, it's the unlucky who get deported. In those circumstances, that's the reason why I think of this, I think of the, the idea that people are in the country illegally. That's only the beginning of the, of the inquiry. The real inquiry is, how is the law going to be enforced against people who are here unlawfully, and is there discrimination there? And so my concern with Arizona, for example, is that the reason the state and local role needs to be diminished is because unless the state and local role is diminished, the chances are very high that discretion will be exercised uh, by people who are going to make traffic stops based on voice of looks. And, um, and so it becomes an area where discretion can be exercised in a way that's discriminatory. Discrimination is very hard to detect when it happens. It's very hard to remedy uh, when it happens. So this is just an example of how um, I'm using chapter one in that rendition of immigration <coughs> history <coughs> then to lead to other conclusions. Um, other conclusions with regard to, um, in particular, the idea of the idea of, um, the idea of uh, state local. State and local role. So that's just one example, uh, but there are many others in the book. But this is just an example of how it is that you start with history, um, and a lot of different things follow. But I would also concede that there are people who have different views of this history, and so that's in the spirit of suggesting that if you if you come up with with a very different view of what policies ought to be today, um, I think a lot of this may have to do with the fact that um, that um, a lot of this may have to do with what it is that um, a lot of it may have to do with the way people uh, view that history and how they view that, that history uh, comes in the next the, the future. But that again goes back to the first purpose of the book, which is that I'm also there's a lot of suggestions I make in the book. Um, for example, greater reliance on the international economic development initiatives. But at the very least, I'm, I'm hopeful that the book will allow people to talk to each other about why they uh, disagree. And I'm, I'm perfectly uh, willing to accept that people will have an interview the history with me, and that's the reason they, they disagree. So let me stop there um, and, and, and see what see what questions you have or um, what I've provoked in here or what I can elaborate. So thanks.